Don't forget the things that are in your bulletin. Uh, we've got um, men's prayer meeting Tuesday morning at 8.30, ladies' prayer meeting Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. We have all of our Wednesday activities at 6 o'clock. And again, please, if you are not a regular attender on Wednesday night, we're going to start a new series on being good stewards in this life. Uh, good stewards of our thoughts, good stewards of the energy that God gives to us, all kinds of things. So would certainly encourage you to be out here on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock. Don't forget next Sunday night we're going to have our chili cook-off. We've had about four people sign up already, and so if you are a chili connoisseur, please get your name up on the list, and we look forward to having a great time in our snack night next Sunday evening. Uh, I believe that Ben has another song for us, and then after that, Jack will have our missions letter, okay? Many of you probably don't traditionally look in your hymnals as we sing, but I would invite you to take your song books and go to song 434. There's something I'd like to point out to us this evening. Last week, I, was, um, I had some downtime, and I was sort of strolling through. My, I have a Facebook account, and came across a post by one of my friends from college, and uh, it was sort of disheartening, yet uh, encouraging, and a challenge to me at the same time. And it says, I'll actually pull it out and read it for you. I don't normally have my phone on stage, but um, he's a pastor in, Pennsylva in uh, Pennsylvania. And he posts an article by Christianity Today uh, entitled, Three American Missionaries Killed in Yemen. He says, these were our missionaries we supported serving in Yemen. This is a reminder that we need to continually pray for our missionaries serving in these dangerous places and for the power of the gospel to break through in miraculous ways. The story is told they worked in a hospital and uh, somebody came in who was uh, pretending to cradle a baby, was actually cradling a gun and came in and, and just, uh, just uh, did devastation there. And um, so I was praying for him, uh, thinking of uh, my pastor friend, but I thought myself too, I mean, what am I doing to pray for our missionaries who are, uh, who are out in the world and, uh, and dealing with those things? Song number 434 has a pretty unique story. And if you look at it, there's four verses to it. Um, the verse three, coincidentally, uh, was written by John Clark, who his father came to North uh, in the 50s, I'm told, I believe, and uh, did an evangelistic meeting there. And so his father came uh, in the 50s to our church, and then he ended up writing the third verse, which says, my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. And then uh, no turning back, no turning back. So he wrote those third verse, but the first, second, and fourth verse uh, were uh, traditional, were traditionally part of the song written uh, years ago. And we're gonna have a short video, uh, I think it's, it's gonna be queued up, that sort of tells the story of uh, this song. And then we're actually gonna sing it the way that it, that it is written uh, or the way that they, uh, it was traditionally told uh, years ago, so. Nearly 200 years ago, a revival took place in Wales, England. And as a result of this revival, many missionaries were called on to foreign mission fields. And many of these missionaries chose as their place of service to go to North India, a place that could best be described as savage. These tribes were famous for a group of men known as headhunters, who as a sign of greatness in their tribe would take the heads of their enemies and hang them on their walls. And it was into this savage tribe that these missionaries came, and obviously they were not welcomed by these tribes. But still, they, they knew they were called by God, and so they continued to share their faith. And they finally reached out to one family who accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this man and his wife and two sons were so contagious about Jesus that they were beginning to lead other villagers and other people from their tribe to Jesus. And the tribal chief got wind of, of, of their faith. And so he called a meeting of the tribe and he, he captured this family and he brought them before the tribe. And he said to the man, he said, renounce Jesus Christ as your savior or something bad is going to happen to you. He said, we're going to kill your children. And the man, he loved his children. He looked down at his sons and he, he loved them, but he knew that he couldn't renounce Jesus Christ. So he, he said the words to this famous song. He said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And the archers pulled back their arrows and they shot dead his two sons. I have 
and he looked at his wife whom he loved so much, his partner in life, but he knew what Scripture said, that he needed to acknowledge God, acknowledge Christ before men. And he said the second line to this famous song. He said, Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. And the archers killed his wife. two sons and his wife lying on the ground in front of him, the tribal chief came before him again and said, Renounce Christ, or this time we'll kill you. And the man, realizing that he had nothing left in this world, looked up at heaven and said the last lines to this song. He said, The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. And in anger, the tribal chief gave the order, and the archers killed the man. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No and now with the man and his two children and his wife dead, the chief stood before this family speechless. He couldn't believe what his eyes had just seen and he realized that through the faith of this man that this God must be real. This Jesus who this man was willing to die for must be real. And on the spot, the reports tell us that this chief accepted Christ as his Savior. And throughout the, the following weeks and months, the rest of the tribes began to accept Christ as their Savior. All because one man and his family were willing to stand up and say, I've decided to follow Jesus. Though no one goes with me, I'm still going to follow. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. I pray there was a challenge to you, and as many reports tell, that uh, not, only, not only did the chief accept Christ, but just many in the tribe, and just uh, it went from there. But uh, I hope that was encouraging to us to remember to pray for our missionaries. Pray for those people who are in harm's way. And we're going to sing three verses of I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And we're actually going to sing uh, like it is up there. The third verse, some of the phrases are switched around. And also, uh, still I will follow on the, on the second verse. So let's stand and we're going to sing three verses. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
that was a great video. Uh, I have, uh, I'm getting behind in my missionary reading. I've got two short ones tonight and one just a little bit longer, but bear with me. Uh, our missionaries uh, sure need some prayers. Your prayers are my prayers as well. This is from the Courage Town Ministries. Dear North Baptist Church, thank you so much for adopting a family this Christmas and sharing the joy and love of the season with needy children. You will bring smiles to their faces on Christmas morning. We at Courage Town Ministries strive to share God's love all year and appreciate that you partner with us to make the season of Christ's birth special. This year, with your help, we were able to service 185 families. We wish you the joy of the season as you celebrate with your family and its Carriage Town Ministries. This is Dear North Baptist Church. Thank you so much for the Christmas money for our family. We really appreciate it. We were able to escape the heat of Dar es Salaam and take a trip to the mountains right after Christmas. We all enjoyed the cooler weather hiking and just bumming around. It was a much needed break. And that's from the Ferrans. This next one here is from the Romains who are in Spain. This is what they have to say. God asked us through Paul in, Rome, in Romans 6, what a benefit, what benefit were you deriving from the things of which uh, you are now ashamed? He goes on to say that the outcome of these things is death. As Christians, we know this, that sin only leads to pain. We remind our daughter of this every time we have to spank her, that her choice to disobey will always result in pain, if only as adults we could remember this when we even think about skipping our devotions, responding harshly to our spouse, or not doing everything God puts in our path to do the best of his ability. Our abilities uh, he has given us. What benefit do we derive from this? It only leads to pain. The Lord has been reminding us this in the face of such open lasciviousness and apathy in the world today. Remember the war for our hearts is not over. Don't give up the fight against sin. Our first Christmas in Spain was quite the blur and the haze of being immersed in a new culture and sleep deprivation from our bundle of boy. The Christmas was so much more enjoyable. We had a great time reflecting on the amazing gift of God through his son and the privilege we have to serve him. In Spain, Christmas is celebrated on the 24th and we were blessed to be able to celebrate with our good friends Juan Carlos and Karina and their precious daughter Sofia. Then on the 25th, we celebrated with the Burdettes. Tim and Pam Darling and Daniel and Kara Darling and their family in the Burdett's new apartment. The arrival of Caleb, Caleb and Sarah. A day we have prayed for uh, for years came one fine day in November when our teammates Sarah and Caleb Burdett arrived fully supported in Spain. After a three week stay in our humble abode, the Lord provided a great apartment just north of town a short walk away. Please keep them in your prayers as they now face the struggles we once did making their initial adjustment to Spanish culture. They have already been a huge encouragement to us and we are looking forward to unfolding the plans God has in store. We kept records of many things we learned upon our arrival and look forward to continuing to help them continue as they uh, get settled down in Spain. Here's some answers to prayer. Rejoicing as the Burdettes reached 100% of their needed support and arrived here in Salamanca, Spain on November the 16th. Our progress in learning Spanish to include our children. Our first visa renewal has been approved and we have been cleared uh, to remain working in Spain. Here's some uh, prayer requests. Pray for the lost cl classmates in our language school and the opportunity to share the gospel for our continued studies in language school and as we prepare for the next few months to pass the Delhi examination in level B1. Pray for the Syrian refugees crisis. We were excited to celebrate Ion's first, Hannah's 30th, Jonathan's 35th, and Adeline's fourth birthday in the months of November and December. Even more fun was celebrating the birth of our Savior who is Christ the Lord. Fifteen years ago was the last time a missionary came to Spain with Baptist Mid-Missions in need of language studies from scratch. Therefore, the learning curve we have had to endure has been one of learning from our mistakes and gaining insight through experience. Thankfully, we have been able to pave the way for future newcomers. At the end of January, we will be finishing our, up our semesters at the official language school of Salamanca. Jonathan will enroll in another class there in the evenings, two hours a day. 
and Hannah will enroll in an intensive course at a different school in the mornings, four hours a day, to try and complete her certification for level B1 in the Delhi accreditation. So pray for our missionaries. That was an excellent video, and I trust that uh, as you uh, have your devotions, our prayer time each day, that you will remember our missionaries. Men, if you want to come forward now. If you'd like to be on the missions committee, we sure welcome you. And uh, it's an exciting committee to be on, and I trust that you'll uh, prayerfully think about that. Let's pray. Father, thanks for today. Thank you for the message of this morning and the challenge from your word. Thank you for our, our missionaries, Father, who faithfully uh, serve you day and day. Some uh, in the past, Father, that who have given their lives uh, for you in the field that you call them to. Thank you for the ministry uh, of this video, Father, in my own heart, and uh, to be more and more faithful in praying for our missionaries. I pray, Father, and thank you for North Baptist Church being a mission-minded church. Now, Father, I pray that you'll bless your offering. Father, I pray that it will be used to bring honor and glory to your name. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Joyce, both offertories is, is today about heaven. So he the pearly gates will open, and this morning what a day that will be. Let's take our song books, go to song number 446. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine. Let's stand as we sing, we'll sing all three verses before our special this evening. 446, blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Amazing. 
singing, you may be seated. This time we'll have a special by Miss Soon Loy. I don't think she's here. Oh, there she is.
right, thank you, Soon. We appreciate that. Let me give you a couple of updates. I um, want to give you the good news that uh, Sue Clark is home. She had a uh, bladder infection, and they've got some medicine right now trying to get that sorted out. So she is at home and resting, not necessarily as comfortably as she'd like, but uh, be praying for Laverne and Sue, and I know they'd appreciate that. Also, I announced in Sunday school this morning, um, Pastor Aaron was not here today, nor this evening, and he will not be here two weeks from today. He is uh, filling the pulpit at a church in Mount Morris this morning and this evening, and if all goes well today, he will be candidating there in two weeks. Uh, Aaron let me know about three and a half years ago that he felt God calling him to pastor a church, and he's been looking. He's been looking at several churches and some uh, that just uh, never did feel right to him and never got too far along in the process. So, but this one, uh, uh, he's uh, been in much prayer about, and so uh, pray for Aaron and Sarah that this would be God's will for their life, and uh, that uh, God will move in a way that only He can, and uh, that's uh, the way we ought to pray for it. So, uh, we should find out uh, He will candidate. I sound a little loud to me up here. Um, so if we can turn me down a little bit, I'd appreciate that. Can you do that for me? Thank you. Um, so uh, if uh, all goes well, he will be um, candidating on the 17th, and they'll be voting on the 24th. So I will keep you posted. You can let Aaron know. Some of you already know. Uh, just let him know that you'll be praying for him and the family, and I know that they would appreciate that. My bucket list for 2016. Uh, I will ask you this publicly. You do not have to answer publicly because maybe for some of you, 2015 was the absolute best year of your life. And if so, then praise the Lord. I'm happy for you. And uh, uh, I hope that, believe it or not, 2016 gets even better. But for most of us, we look back and it's like, whew, a rough year and we hope that 2016 or the next year whatever it is we hope that it gets a little better and I would guess that most of us in here would say you know I'd like to have a better 2016 than I did 2015 and I'm going to give you 10 things that I'm going to work on this year and if you choose to write them down and follow them praise the Lord if you choose to come up with your own bucket list of what you ought to do as a Christian then praise the Lord. But I can tell you this in all honesty. I don't think there's a one of us in this room that can honestly say, I did everything for the Lord in 2015 that I should have. Amen? Hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Folks, we all have work to do. Let's be honest. We've all got work to do. And I'm going to give you my list of ten things with a couple of verses to back each one of them up. And we'll be finished. First thing, read your Bible. Psalm 119 and 105 says what? Anybody know? Close. Not quite. Don't be afraid. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Folks, we live in the darkest world that has ever been seen. And we need the light of God's word every day. We need it. The amazing thing about God's word is in Psalm 119 and verse 11, the Bible says what? Anybody got it? I will hide its words in my heart that I might not what? Sin against God. The Bible is telling us here that God's Word will keep us from sinning. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm willing to be more than transparent up here and tell you that I sinned a whole lot more in 2015 than I should have. That's just the truth. And I didn't spend near as much time in God's Word as I should have. Two things you need to do when it comes to reading God's Word. First of all, Read it through. Second of all, find some sort of devotion. 
that applies to you, that speaks to you, that you can learn from, and a nugget that you can hold on to for an hour or two each day. Number one, read your Bible. Number two, this is where I'm going to lose a lot of us. Witness to five people this year. Five. Can you imagine if everybody in the church witnessed to five people what the results would be? This, ladies and gentlemen, for Christians is not a suggestion. It is not an option. Matthew 28 and verse 20 tells us what? Go ye. Not if you feel like it. It says go. And teach all nations. And Luke 1 and verse 8 tells us that we will be what? By the power of the Holy Spirit. We will be witnesses. simple fact is Christians do not like witnessing. They just don't. And for any given number of reasons, we don't like it. Well, I don't want to impose on somebody that doesn't believe in I do. They have Christian liberty. They have the, the, the freedom to believe whatever they want to believe. I, I just can't go up to a stranger and, and knock on their door and, and, and you know, just start talking about God. You know, and, and, and I agree with you. Door to door is a tough thing. To walk right up to a stranger's door and tell him, hey, you're a sinner and you're going to go to hell if you don't get your heart right. Well, normally that's going to get a door slammed in your face. We need to be careful about how we witness. This is one thing we talked about in the leadership retreat this past October. This church needs a stronger emphasis on soul. And guess whose fault that is? Mine. It's just that simple. We need to be soldiers. A lot of us are prayer warriors, but we need to be soldiers. When it comes to heaven, that's all that matters. Who did I witness to? Who did I tell about the Lord? Five people. In one year, talk to five people. Don't talk to the same person five times. Go ahead and do that. But let's not cheat the Lord here. Five different people. What do you think about heaven and hell? You believe in God? What do you think about Jesus Christ? Are you sure you'd go to heaven? You know, if you would pray hard enough about this very thing, Odds are you won't even have to go looking for the people. God will bring them to you. All you have to do is find the, bold, the boldness to open up. Number one, read your Bible. Number two, witness to five people this year. Number three, here's a different one. Invite five people to church this year. The Bible tells us in Luke 14 and 23, we're to compel them to come in. You know, I don't know about you, but I kind of happen to like it here. It's fun. This is where our family resides. I don't know about you, but for me and my wife, this is our whole life, this church. We love it. We love the people here. We help each other. We encourage each other. We comfort one another. We admonish one another. We're not perfect. We're not even close. But I happen to think we got something good going on. Invite five people to church. Here's another one. And we're going to help you with that, by the way. We're going to have a couple of special Sundays throughout the year. Bring a friend Sunday. Bring a friend Sunday. Here's another one. Invest in your family. We'll start with the husbands, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Again, fellas, that's not a suggestion. It's not an option. 
We look at the problems in our world today, and there are lots of them. But the biggest reason that our world is failing today is because of the breakdown of the family. It's just that simple. The breakdown of the family. We can, bring go- we, can, we can blame governments all day long. And certainly, governments play a role. Especially when they redefine family. But husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church. First Peter says we ought to honor our wives as the weaker vessel. We've talked about this before when the Bible says, he who findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And I've always questioned that word good. That doesn't seem uh, 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 high enough to describe a wife, which is how Jesus Christ looks at the church, his bride. It's like, God, a good thing? That's all you see for a wife is a good thing? But again, we have to go back to what the word good means. Remember when the rich young ruler said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looked at him and said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good save God. In the Bible, specifically in the New Testament, when you're talking about good, it is referring to a term that is attributing glory to God and God alone. And so when the Bible says, He who findeth a wife findeth a good thing, that puts her in some pretty high company. And wives, you ought to honor and respect your husbands. Not perfect, not even close. Never been a perfect husband ever born. But they need to be loved and honored and respected as they try to be leaders in the home. Invest in your spouse. Invest in your children. Invest in your grandchildren. brothers, sisters, cousins, make an investment in your immediate family. You know, that is not an easy thing to do because we live in a selfish world where my family ought to be looking out for me. You know, I catch myself at the end of the day, I go home and I plop in front of the television while the rest of of the family is out doing something else. What a terrible testimony. You know, maybe that can fly for five or ten minutes. But we need to invest in our immediate family. Here's another one. Number five. See, the sermon's half over. Let go of anger. Can I be honest with you? There's probably not an angrier person in this room than the one you're looking at right now. I don't mind telling you, I get angry very easily. Very easily. You know, I I believe with all my heart that if I could stop driving, I would have no anger issues at all. I'm convinced of that. Folks, we live in a world today where it's so very easy to get angry and to get mad. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. And you know what this text says. Go ahead, Michaela. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What's the one I want before that? Thank you. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Now, I just said don't be angry, right? I'm going against God and His Word. No. We certainly need to be angry at some things in this world. Definitely. There are reasons to have righteous indignation and to let our anger be known. I'm talking about the anger that gets the best of us on a daily basis. We need to let go of that. Look at verse 31. Ephesians 4 and verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. God says this has to go. Christians cannot afford to be angry people. 
Here's the next one. Practice patience. Kind of goes hand in hand with anger, does it not? James chapter 1 says this in verses 3 and 4. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. But let what? Patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I don't know which is more true of me. That I am far too angry or that I don't have enough patience. They run neck and neck. I'm not a very patient person. We live in a microwave world, do we not? I want it right now. I can get it right now. Our smartphones allow us to have it right now. Folks, we need to practice patience with our spouse, with our children, with people that we work with, people that we go to church with, because not everybody's going to see things our way. Not everybody's going to do things our way. Not everybody's going to have the sense of urgency that you and I might have. We need to practice patience. I believe God has allowed us to have a new 1958 house that needs to be completely remodeled so that one certain individual can practice patience. Pray for Mary that she'll get that patience. <laughs> Would anybody disagree with me? Patience is a killer, isn't it? Anger and patience are killers. Next one. Number seven. Befriend someone in the church. Find somebody new. Get to know them. As we were leaving today, there was two couples in here talking that never really talked before. Kind of neat to see. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 and 24 that if we want to have many friends, we ought to do what? Show ourselves friendly. Take the first step. Get to know somebody in your family. Maybe they're new. Make them feel welcome. I don't know you, but my name's Helen, so. You know, it's, it's, it's frustrating because I had a person come up to me this morning. I don't have my regular seat. You know, folks, and I've got to be honest with you, sometimes I just don't know how to respond to that. You know what? Sit beside those people. Introduce yourself to them. Get to know your church family. Because the truth is, we have some pretty cool people in this church. And you ought to get to know them. Number eight. We ought to stop at about seven. Control your tongue. Look at James chapter three. Now we're asking the impossible. The Bible all but says it's impossible. James 3 and verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body, but also the ships. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil. Full of deadly poison. You know, this morning we talked about your adversary, the devil. Shoot, we don't have to worry about the devil. It lives right here. Doesn't it? Huh? You know, I think 
If we want to have a better 2016 than we did 2015, focus on that one and letting go of your anger, your year would be completely different. I don't know how many times I say things and in a matter of seconds, I wish I'd take that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that. What was my intention for saying that? Usually it's to inflict pain on somebody. To get my point across. To make my feelings known. To make my opinion heard. To put somebody in their place. We just read in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. Put away all these things. Evil speaking and the clamor. Control your tongue. Number nine. Pray more consistently and fervently. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 says what? Three words. Pray without ceasing. James 5, 16 says what? The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man. What's your prayer life like? Is every prayer uh, said at meals the exact same thing? Is it vain repetition? We need to be more consistent and more fervent in our prayer. Finally, number 10. Let go of two bad habits. Should be in James. Go back a couple pages to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. We talked about this Wednesday night. Hebrews 12, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We talked about this Wednesday night, and there's, there's part of that passage that we just kind of skip over. The sin which, what, doth so easily beset us. There's some habits that we need to let go of. Not that they're sinful, not that they're wrong, but if you want to have a better year this year than you did last year, maybe you ought to let go of those things that are cluttering your mind, cluttering your time, and give that a time and attention to the Lord whether it's television or social media or shopping or sporting activities or whatever. I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. But if you do have some bad habits where it's, it's taking up your time and attention, would it be better spent getting to know the Lord a little bit? So that's laying aside every weight. Maybe we ought to focus, too, on the sins which does so easily beset us. Isn't it interesting how God puts it down in paper, that it does so easily beset us, and He is exactly right. You know, that's my bucket list. I can sit here, and I can look at every one of those, There's 10 of them. And I can tell you right now, I did well on one. You know, it's pretty easy for me as the pastor to befriend people in the church. I want to get to know people. So if this is my report card for 2015, I got 10%. I don't know what your report card would look like. I don't know what your bucket list would look like. But I do want you as a Christian to have a more victorious year in 2016 than you did 2015. Father, we love you. Lord, how I pray that we will draw closer to you. 
in this coming year than we ever have before. The Lord, we would redeem the time, that we would recognize that the time is drawing very near. Lord, I am very, very excited to go to heaven. I can't wait. And I don't know when that time is coming, but I feel it will be very soon. But God, in the meantime, there are things we must be doing. You've given us this time here on earth to do many things. To practice up our prayer life. To practice up our worship. Because that's what we're going to be doing in heaven. You've given us time here on this earth to understand you better by reading your word. You've given us time here on earth to witness to people so that friends and family might join us in heaven. But God, we get so easily distracted because of this or because of that. The, 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 the weights that we don't lay aside and the sins which do so easily beset us. Lord, your word tells us through the Apostle Paul that he forgot about those things which are behind and he pressed toward the mark which was ahead of him. Father, I pray for everyone here in our shortcomings in 2015. Lord, there's not a thing we can do about that. But God, I pray you give us the strength, give us the power through the Holy Spirit that we might know you better, that we might have a renewed passion for your word, that we might have a passion to invite people to church, that we might have a passion for our immediate family members, that we might be the better husband, the better son, the better wife, the better mother, the better dad, whatever the case may be. God, help us to look at our family members that you've given to us as a precious both in our immediate family and in our church family. God, help us to do everything we can to encourage one another, to speak the truth in love, but to encourage one another. Lord, help us for those that have issues with anger, issues with patience, issues with controlling the tongue. Lord, those are high mountains to climb. I pray that you'd give us victory this year. Lord, I thank you for each and every person that's come out. And Lord, I pray that each and every person here would come up with their own to-do list of how I can be a better, stronger Christian in 2016. God, we love you. We thank you for your patience. We thank you that you do not get easily angered with us. You are very long-suffering. You have a very meek spirit. Not weak, but very meek. Father, we thank you for your attributes. Help us to be more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Appreciate your patience and indulgence with that. We are going to move very quickly into our uh, business meeting. We're going to